Let's uh, begin with a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Lord, we give you this conference. We give you the gift of our families. Ask that you be with us as we look at all the options that lie before us and that we try to grow together into stronger families, stronger individuals, and grow stronger in our faith. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin by introducing the uh, wisdom facilitators. They'll be here throughout the um, conference, and you can probably tell them by their big tags. Um, and so, you know, nab them at any time if there are any, any questions at all or any, any things, that, things that come to mind or things you just want to bounce around. So could we have some, why don't we just have the facilitators come up to the front? That'll be easier than trying to introduce them in the crowd. Besides, then I'll, I won't forget someone. Sorry, I'm Ken Noster. I'm the director of Wisdom Homeschooling. I always forget to introduce myself. <clears throat> Over on the far left, we have Kim Schultz. She and her husband, Dan, live in Lac La Biche, and uh, they work primarily in the north, but um, in other places, too. Next to Kim, we have Joan. Should have, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Joan Bishop, who's down near Gwyn. And Joan and uh, her husband, Barry, have been homeschooling for a long time. And uh, Joan is still homeschooling at home, so she's running a little lighter load this year than she did last year, just so that she doesn't miss out on the most important part in her work. And then we have Mark Meeks, who's now in Calgary, but <laughs> works all over the place. Uh, partly because he has lived all over the place. So when he lived near Marwain, he got all the northeastern families, and then he lived north of Edmonton near Westlock, and he got all the kind of central northern families. And then he moved down to Calgary, and he's got a bunch down there. So he wears out tires. <laughs> and then we have Michelle Barter. She and her husband, Mike, uh, work on the road uh, as a team. Michelle lives uh, just east of Edmonton and uh, works uh, mostly in the central, but some in the northern area as well. We have Glenn Spies, who um, is sort of north and central, but south too, and works in administration as well as, uh, as a, a facilitator. Paul Vandenbosch from Red Deer, who uh, is kind of in that north-south corridor, and in the far north. He and Kim look after quite a large population in the La Crete, uh, Fort Vermilion area, and the Peace Country. Simon Noster, who's the baby facilitator. <laughs> uh, he never saw a school until he did his intern teaching. <laughs> uh, so he was, uh, yeah. <laughs> He kind of uh, um, helps people from the inside out. He, he, he's the only one on our team who was actually homeschooled through his entire uh, school years. And uh, so this is your team uh, that's present. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, regrets from Louis Sain, especially to his families, who he wanted to touch base with here. Louis... Um, got as far as, um, I think it was somewhere near Drumheller and had major engine issues. So he disconnected one cylinder in terms of <laughs> intake and power and limped back to, to Medicine Hat. Um, also regrets from Rachel Godin uh, to the, her family's the people that she wanted to touch base with here today. Uh, Rachel's at her uncle's funeral today. 
So here we are. Um, one thing I want to mention now, because I'll probably forget it later, and that is there is lunch available at the uh, concession here at lunchtime, and really encourage you to stay rather than going out somewhere for lunch if you haven't brought lunch um, to just stick around, because this is a great social time as well as uh, a time to kind of figure things out and learn things. Last year, we had one student come to us and, and, and report that he had gone to every single institution and had a significant conversation with each of them and found it very, very, very helpful, even though there were things that you know, he had no notion of being interested in. And he was surprised at how much he learned and uh, how helpful it was. So I'd encourage you, I mean, the, the institutions that are here um, are here and wanting to talk to you. So, you know, if you want to have social time, two or three of you together go around to all the tables. But do visit, try to visit them all, and you may be surprised what you find out about what's out there and about what's in here. So our theme is forward confidently. So confidently, why, why, are we, why can we go forward confidently? Well, I think you know. Because you're cared for. Because God looks after every aspect of your life. He has a plan. Not a drop of water comes to earth and returns to heaven without fulfilling its purpose. And we are far more than a drop of water. Nothing goes unnoticed. And he provides. The whole notion of looking for a career isn't a matter of inventing anything. It's a matter of discovering what you're actually called to, equipped for, and what really is your mission. And this is all, it's, it's kind of exciting that, and, and soothing, that even though there are a lot of unknowns at this point, there really is, uh, you, you, have a, you have a purpose and you have a destiny, and it will, it will reveal itself. We need just to need to do our part and prepare ourselves academically and spiritually and socially, intellectually, to, to approach the, uh, to be available to, and to uh, be open to that calling. So what will he call you to do? Will he call you to serve yourself or to serve others? So the question is, are you here to give or are you here to get? The world says get. Now, why would the world say get? Is the world just an evil, awful place? No. The world is a commercial place. We are, our, our society is driven by business, and business in itself is a good thing. But of course, within that, there's always this propensity to greed, to want more. And business that wants more needs you to want more. If you're satisfied with what you have, you're not going to be encouraged to spend on things you don't really need. And if you don't really want extra income, you're not going to be easily manipulated into spending your time the way big companies would want you to. You know, I'm sure you've heard, you deserve this holiday, you deserve a bigger house, you deserve this new car. The more you want for yourself, the more the world can sell you. And there's probably few places more graphic at the moment than the oil patch, although big business does the same thing. Perceiving that if they give you enough money, they own you. Paul Vandenbosch, one of our facilitators, uh, came west, came to Alberta as manager of uh, one of the largest Home Depot stores Canada-wide in Red Deer. And it was expected of him that he put in mega hours, at least 60 hours a week at work. If you wanted to be in upper management, whether you were being paid for the hours or not, you put in the time. I've spoken to young engineers who are hired by oil companies who are expected to 
put in far more investment of their own time, essentially donate their life to their work if they want to get ahead. And so the dollar is always there beckoning. The position is always there beckoning. But it easily owns the person. And eventually, or perhaps even very quickly, we find that we've given up a lot of our life. Scripture says the other side. And even common sense says the other side. For people who, you know, don't believe in the errant truth and inerrant truth in Scripture, common sense would dictate that we're here to give. Our society, our family, our society, our world will not survive without givers. Takers will dissemble or dismantle our culture. Whatsoever you do to one of these, the least of my brothers, you do it to me. And Jesus also said, he who would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever of you would be first must be last of all, or least of all. So we're called to emulate the person who came not to be served, but to serve. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing great things. Not saying we all have to crouch around and be small and meek. No, it's great to be called to do great things. But number one, is it a call? Or is it just something we want to prove? Do we just want to be a big deal? Have lots of money and power and influence and leisure? Or do we truly want to serve? I go to an optometrist now and again because I'm getting old eyes, as you can see. And uh, I really like this guy. He gets it. He spends part of his time, annually if he's able, down in the third world serving people for free. He continually is donating to third world countries. This man could be wealthy and comfortable. He could have retired by now and sold his business and be living in the lap of luxury. But he uses his skill as an optometrist to serve. And he not only serves people out there, he serves the, the, the ordinary people in his community too. In that, you know, you go to him and you need magnifying glasses to be able to see. And he goes, you know, you, you really don't need to buy glasses from me. Just go down to the drugstore and for $20 you can get just what you need. Or your prescription is fine for now. You know, this, this desire to have it work for the customer, if you will, for the person he's serving as opposed to serving himself. Is he joyful? And does his business suffer? Not at all. People are clamoring to see the man because they know what he's made of. So we're called to serve. We're called to serve in our personal relationships too. We desire exclusive relationships, and naturally we should. But it's easy to fall into these relationships, even into marriage early, because of what we need. We need the security of somebody really loving us, or we need to feel complete or whole, or the things we need. We need to look at those relationships, too, and consider it's time to enter into that sort of relationship when we have something to give, some emotional maturity, some financial stability, some uh, capacity to live in the world, and then we have something to give to a relationship. It's pretty much every aspect of our life that really needs to be our balancing question. Am I called in this to give or to get? A lot of people hate their work. There are a lot of people who just put up with their work so they get their paycheck and go home. Your passions and your interests, your abilities, are not a mistake. But those can be used for jobs, for work, that you just aren't called to. And, it, and you feel it. And you see it all around us. People who just don't feel right with where they are, but they can't afford 
to do anything different because they become immersed in it and dependent on the finances of it. If you're working to serve God, to serve your neighbor, you will never hate your work. Guaranteed. Because even if that work is extremely difficult and inconvenient, consider the great people you have known historically. None of them hated their work. Consider Jesus. His work was very difficult, ultimately the cross, but he didn't hate it. He embraced it and was glorified by doing it. So fulfill your mission. Your attitude makes all the difference between your fulfillment and your frustration. Now, as you're looking at where you're going, what, what you want to study, and ultimately throughout your life. So are you here to give or to get?